This video is brought to you by NVIDIA and the new MSI Sword G15 30 series laptop, which I got to check out as part of this review. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about how NVIDIA's and MSI's next gen hardware can transform the way you play. If I was Uncle Phil of Xbox or Uncle Jim from Sony, I'd be like, Hello, is this Neon Giant? Yes, how much to buy you? All of the money? Okay, yes, all of the money, that can be arranged. Thank you, goodbye. I say this because The Ascent, the debut game from the brand spanking new Neon Giant, is fucking awesome. One of the silver linings of COVID turning the video game industry upside down this past 18 months is that indie studios are having their moment in the sun. Reorienting a workforce of a AAA studio, 800 or more people strong, all of whom are used to working in large, well-resourced offices, it's really hard. So you can understand why so many AAA games have been significantly delayed, leaving a very skint AAA release schedule this year. Filling that void are the indies, teams of 2, 5, 10, 20 people, most of whom have worked worked remotely from the start, and all of whom are working on more narrow, focused projects less susceptible to delays. Which brings us to The Ascent, the first game from a newly created Swedish studio. The team is 12 core members, and they describe themselves as industry veterans who've worked on games including Bulletstorm, Far Cry 3, Gears of War, and Doom. When playing The Ascent, you can absolutely feel this veteran status coursing through it. Clearly, game-making experts made this video game. You cannot make something this good your first go-around. Or at least you probably can't, I don't know. Point is, this is really excellent, and I love bumping into stuff like this in my job. You can see a title that looks really nice, and it has a cool trailer and whatever, and then you play it, and you're like, yeah, it's pretty good. This is one of those times where I'm like, yes, give me more of this. Give me more of this world, give me more of these weapons, more of this combat, more of this soundtrack, Jesus. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that everything is perfect because this game does have some technical issues that definitely made their presence felt and some other minor things along the way, but bottom line, this is such a great, great game and I just want to play more of it. Even though I finished it, I want to play more of it and that is a good sign. So I think we need to start with the most obvious and striking element of The Ascent, how good this game looks. The Ascent is set somewhere, somewhere with a lot of aliens and a lot of technology and a lot of guns and a lot of capitalism. You begin your journey in the bowels of this great hive city, and I use that term rather deliberately because the opening sections definitely give off some strong Warhammer vibes, with dense rusted industria creating a narrow labyrinth for you to explore. Already you're seeing the incredible detail present in every square inch of it. The electrical arteries, the scraps strewn about the floor, the machinery endlessly laboring in the foreground and background. As you exit the space, you get your first of the Ascent's many perspective shifts, the camera abandoning the rigid isometric perspective to pan around and showcase the world more broadly. This vista was just a precursor for what was to come. I played through this opening section with my editor Austin and my friend Zendrew. Don't worry Austin, we're also friends buddy. You're not just an editor to me. Anyway, when we got out of this lift, we were all like, holy shit, what the fuck? The massive transparent roadway just rolled on and on, teeming with alien life, neon signs illuminating every surface, and the monolithic cityscape in the background. The density of it all was so striking. There were just so many people and aliens. There was so much tech and so much lighting and just so much. It was overwhelming, and this footage absolutely does not do it justice. This was captured at 1440p and then compressed down by the recording software and further compressed by YouTube's shit tier compression. Seeing this on an actual monitor or a TV running natively, Mac settings, it looks two or three times better than this because there's just so much detail in every part of it and all of that detail just jumps out at you, whatever you're looking at. The Ascent's environments simply do not quit from dense commercial 
social hubs to steamy slums to Yakuza-run houses of vice to research labs to artificial intelligence mainframes and beyond. It's crazy how good this world design is. And it's impossible not to compare it to Blade Runner or Altered Carbon or at times even Star Wars. It invites, it demands comparisons to those sci-fi touch points because it's so clearly drawing from them as an inspiration, but it's fusing them together so seamlessly to create something so compelling. And all of this is separate from how the game uses perspective shifts to highlight key locations and monuments. Often the camera will shift into a side-on view to better profile the background, or a front view to show you something in the distance, or a pulled back view while you ride a lift allowing you to see more of the incredible skyline behind you. When the game is doing this, it's just straight up flexing. Whenever it happened, I was like, artists, calm down, Jesus, let me breathe. The people that made this knew how good this looked, and when they do this shit, they're just making sure that everyone else knows as well. Good graphics do not a good game maketh, but sometimes they certainly help, and I'd be lying if I didn't say that a fairly chunky chunk of my appreciation of this title stemmed from the sheer satisfaction I got from looking at it. You might be wondering how well all of this runs, and it's a bit of a mixed bag here. So I tested this on two PCs, one with a 2080 and the other with a 3080. I ran max settings and I ran at 1440p. Now, quick trip through the options menu. It's okay, there's a VSync toggle, some basic graphical settings. There's the option to run DirectX 12, which unfortunately I couldn't test. Reason being, the developers told me not to. I got sent a list of known issues during the review window and the developers informed me that DirectX 12 was causing stability issues something they traced to NVIDIA's drivers. They said they were working with NVIDIA on a fix and that should be available in time for launch, but obviously I can't guarantee that. Those are their words, not mine. What this meant is that I couldn't test DirectX 12 functionality or ray tracing since ray tracing was tied to DirectX 12 being enabled. Even without ray tracing, the lighting in this game is nuts. So the first thing I'm doing when the DirectX 12 fix goes in is I'm booting up this game and playing through at least some of it with ray tracing enabled because I would love to see how this could look even better than it already does. The game also has DLSS, the Nvidia tech that scales down resolution while maintaining image quality. I always like to keep this running at balance since I find performance mode can often degrade image quality a little, particularly when it comes to distant objects or fine textures such as hair or cabling. Look, on both machines running at max settings with DLSS enabled, I was able to hit very consistent frame rates 95% of the time, but there were definitely stutters at key moments, typically when a lot of particle effects were popping off or environment destruction was kicking in. It wasn't deal breaking, but it was a sort of stuttering that would interrupt the flow of the action, which was a little disappointing. Hopefully the Nvidia drivers and DirectX 12 will smooth those out. One quick note, I played this with a controller and a keyboard and mouse. Obviously not at the same time, separately. But both work perfectly, no complaints, except for the fact that you can't rebind your buttons when using a controller. That sucks, hopefully that can be patched in later. I had no crashes at all during my playthrough and only minor bugs, like a currency duplication glitch which we discovered that basically gave you infinite cash. Not a big deal because money is not at all hard to come by in this game and it doesn't really matter, but it was still quite funny. Even though there weren't many bugs, there were quite a few unfinished elements here and coupled with the DirectX 12 issues, I get the feeling that this was just one or two patches shy of being 100% ready to ship. For example, there are side quests in this game. You get them pretty thick and fast. On at least three occasions, the game would send me to a side quest location only for that location to not yet be accessible because I hadn't unlocked it through the main storyline. There's actually no way for you to know that until you get to that place. And the door is like right there and it's open, but you can't walk through it. There's no UI or quest text or anything telling you, hey, you can't do this yet. And that's what I'm talking about, right? Those quests should not have been available to me at that point. Or if they were, there should have been some kind of disclaimer telling me I can't do them yet. Or when I got to the location, there should be some pop-up being like, hey, progress the story to access this. None of that was there. That's the stuff I'm sure will get patched in later, likely soon, but it's not there yet and it was really frustrating when I bumped into it. I think this issue is most felt when it comes to navigation, which is easily the biggest weakness of the title from a design perspective. The city you'll explore is broken up into districts, each of which have different layers and within those layers different levels of elevation. It's really hard to make your way around this world with any intention. If you just want to fumble your way toward a location, sure, you can follow the marker and you'll get there eventually, probably, 
but if you want to get somewhere fast, efficiently, etc., the map is difficult to read and use, the location markers are way too unclear, and there's no mini-map available, meaning that you keep having to open your menu or follow the GPS ping thing, which often just leads you in the wrong direction. There's other UI stuff that needs a pass as well. This is the currency you use to upgrade your weapons. There are three tiers of this currency. Do you know how to tell them apart? This tiny little microscopic letter in the middle of the cog. I couldn't even tell what this was until I like squinted and moved within an inch of my monitor. Obviously that should not be like that. And that's what I mean. There's just a few things, some of them big, some of them small, that tell me this game was just one or two patches shy of being fully ready to ship. While that stuff is annoying, it didn't stop me from loving this game. And I don't think it'll stop you either because this game has got it where it counts. The Ascent can be played in a variety of ways, solo or with up to three friends, either through online co-op or couch co-op. I tested both solo and online co-op, didn't have anyone to play couch co-op with, so can't comment on that. I don't believe the game has any sort of matchmaking. I certainly couldn't see it in the menus and I googled for information on it but couldn't find anything. So I'm pretty sure it doesn't, it just means that you'll have to manually invite friends to your games through either Steam or your Xbox friends list. The game does come with crossplay for PC and Xbox, which is great, but keep in mind that that will only work if you're playing the Microsoft Store version of the game on PC, not the Steam version. That's kind of easy though, since the game is on Game Pass, which is very handy. The journey begins here in character creation. I was playing co-op from the very start, and while we're setting up our characters, you can actually see the people next to you setting up their characters, which was a nice touch. You're a classic blank slate nobody, dropped into the world at a moment where criminal gangs and powerful corporate interests are vying for control of the city, and you are just the right cudgel for them to pick up and start swinging. After the opening tutorial block, you'll arrive at Cluster 13, a dense commercial district full of people and bars and shop fronts as well as the local stack boss, who needs you to do some things for him, even though he's not particularly polite in those requests. Oh, look at you. Positively bristling with ambition and a taste for mindless violence. Guess what I need. The quality of the voice acting and writing here is pretty emblematic of what you can expect throughout the rest of the game. It's very good. It's dense. It's fast. It's got a lot of techno babble thrown in to help sell the world. It's always interesting to listen to these characters, so it's a bit of a shame that the sound mixing isn't great. I played using both speakers and headphones, and certainly character dialogue volume could be really inconsistent and quite hard to hear sometimes. Another one of those things I expect will get patched at some point. Still, the Ascent's characters and stories draw you in. You have to pay close attention because it certainly doesn't slow down to make sure you're keeping up. But if you put on your concentration hat, you'll find a sci-fi story that isn't going to sit alongside Mass Effect or anything, but it certainly holds its own. The story is delivered through a main campaign questline that will take you around 10 to 15 hours to get through, depending on how much you beeline it. In addition, there are side quests. These aren't much to speak of narratively. Typically some random NPC who'll sort of make some noises at you and he tells you he wants you to go steal some steroids for his buddies or something. Generally speaking, these just push you out into the corners of the map that the main quests don't, so they're useful from a gameplay perspective. You've seen a lot of shooting up to this point and you may be wondering, is that all there is? And the answer is yes, that's it. There's no dialogue options, no puzzles, no party management. I think one of the questions I had going into this was, is this just a twin stick shooter or is it sort of a CRPG or like a real-time XCOM, etc. No, it's definitely a twin-stick shooter and a damn fine one at that. My first encounter with the depth built into the Ascent combat happened rather by accident. The very first enemies the game threw at us, I couldn't shoot them. I was holding down the left trigger to aim down sights and pulling the right trigger to fire. Confusingly, nothing was hitting. I was like, uh, maybe my aim is bad? And then Austin was like, what the fuck? I can't shoot anything. And I'm like, I know, right? And I was worried that the game was somehow bugged or something. Turns out the aim down sights lifts your weapon up, whereas leaving it in the default position is sort of like hip firing it lower. The enemies we were facing were really short enemies, so what was happening is that we were essentially shooting over their heads. It was quite a relief to discover this. This mechanic is actually really central to the game though, and actually does a huge amount to separate this twin stick combat from a lot of other twin stick shooters you might have played. Remember how I mentioned before the idea of a real-time XCOM? It's not that, but it's got at least some of that DNA here because
cover is super important. You can crouch down at any time to hide behind cover, and you can then press the aim down sights button to lift your weapon up over the cover and start shooting. It looks like a blind fire, but it's not. It's just as accurate and just as deadly as if you were standing out in the open aiming down sights. This one mechanic infuses the combat with a lot of depth. When you're entering a combat space, your first instinct is to look for the cover points. You may not need them if you're high enough level or the enemies are too exposed, but you might need them if things get hairy and you're always doing a mental inventory of your surroundings whenever you begin an encounter. Combat is ultimately built around the need for cover, at least in more challenging moments. Some enemies deal a lot of damage if they're able to unload a full magazine into you, so face tanking stuff just isn't an option. At the same time, sitting behind behind cover and slowly picking off enemies also isn't an option. Enemies are really clever. They aggressively reposition and flank you to make you uncomfortable. There are melee enemy types that will rush you, forcing you to move, and there are ranged enemies who can lob grenades or mortar fire to flush you out of cover. Later on in the game, new enemies arrive who deploy tech to buff, shield, and heal their allies. These guys always hide behind cover in the backline, so the only way to break through these encounters is to bring them down first, which generally means putting you in a pretty exposed position. I hate the word visceral when talking about video games. It's very overused, but we're going to use it here, okay? Combat in the Ascent is almost as strategic as it is visceral. It demands precise aim and quick movements, yes, but it also demands strong awareness of your surroundings, of the enemies you're fighting, and the cover available to you. This is not a mindless arcade-style twin shooter. There's a lot more going on under the hood here. The tactical depth of the Ascent is further enhanced by the game's impressive suite of weapons and abilities. From SMGs to assault rifles to burst rifles to sniper rifles to actual rocket launchers, there's a fair amount of weapon variety to be had here. Weapons feel familiar but dependable, each of them facilitating a different play style like the up-close SMGs or shotguns or the sniper best suited to the backline. Obviously, playing in groups is going to give the weapon archetypes more room to flourish since you might want to have a frontline focused party member supported by a sniper in the back, etc. This is even more the case when it comes to the Ascent's abilities. You can equip two of these at any time as well as a tactical grenade. The grenades are pretty cool. They float slowly across the battleground and can be detonated whenever you choose, producing either stun effects, big ass explosions, or an anti-gravity well that will pick up and flip enemies like a pancake. The abilities or augments are very cool. You can do a massive falcon punch that will KO pretty much anything. You can prime enemies for detonation so that when they die, their corpses explode like this. You can summon minions like this little tank bot who is very handy when playing solo, or a swarm of tiny spider bots who will fuck absolutely anything up. There's plenty more of these abilities, many of which I didn't get a chance to try, but they're inviting you to either try them out or create new characters so you can spec into these abilities more deeply, improving their efficiency. That brings me to one of the areas of the game that I think is a little weak, the RPG side. There are stats that you can pump up here and each of them are linked to certain augments. So if I improve my crit chance, I'm also making the corresponding abilities associated with that stat stronger. This is a little undercooked because some of these stats are super strong, like crit chance and health, and some of them are not, like more energy, allowing you to roll more often. You don't need that. Furthermore, I was pretty much able to max out the most powerful stats without any effort, which I think tells me the economic tuning of this isn't quite right. Implicit in the Ascent is the suggestion that you create more characters and play through the game again with a different build, leveling up different weapons or stats as you do. I'm definitely inclined to play more of the Ascent, but it's probably in spite of these RPG systems rather than because of them. The Ascent is just cool. It's fun. It's awesome. The sheer thrill of combat is always so satisfying. That's what'll keep me coming back. Hopefully that RPG stuff can be tuned in some later patches to give them some more lasting appeal. I think I've provided what I hope is a pretty balanced view of the Ascent, calling out some of its technical and design shortcomings as I went. I just want to be really clear though, I really love this game. One of my favorite things about it is how organic and lived in the world feels and how spontaneously it can descend into absolute chaos depending on your actions. You'll spend a lot of time going from point A to point B in this world and as you move through it, you'll see that it's packed with civilians everywhere, even where they shouldn't be. As you move through them, you'll find plenty of neutral hostiles, as in they're just holding their ground and if you avoid them, it's fine, but if you get too close, then it's on like Donkey Kong. At that point, chaos erupts as civilians get caught in a crossfire and nearby vehicles start exploding as collateral damage and more and more enemies pour in through nearby doorways or jumping over railings or airdropped in by hovercraft. 
And the soundtrack, my lord, the dirgy synth just kicking hard while all this destruction rains down. And then all of a sudden, it's over. The last bad guy is dispatched and things go quiet and you continue on your way. I mentioned earlier that navigating this world was a little frustrating at times. I didn't mind all that much though, because just wandering around this world, seeing its sights, listening to its sounds, soaking up all the mayhem that blossoms from every unexpected flashpoint, it's all just so good. I was thinking about the future of this game, and I think there's so much you can do with it. Like, if development on this continued and they added new areas, new quest lines, new weapons, armor abilities, I mean, you could grow this to be a really meaty twin-stick shooter ARPG hybrid. And there's not many games like that on the market, that are in this setting at least. The only technology-based ARPGs I can think of are Warhammer games like Inquisitor Mata. There's probably some other ones that I've forgotten, but the point is, I really hope we see a lot more of The Ascent in future, either through game updates or DLC or expansions or sequels because the bones of this game are just rock solid. But even without all that extra stuff, this is still, right now, a fantastic game that I really recommend playing, whether it's solo, but especially with some friends, because it is just a blast. Love to see it. Congrats, Neon Giant. You guys rock. One last thing before we go, thanks to NVIDIA and MSI, I also had the chance to play The Ascent on the new Sword GF15 laptop. This laptop is truly next-gen because it has the latest 30 series GPU built in, meaning you'll get all the benefits of the latest GPU hardware in portable form. What are those benefits, you ask? Well, obviously, the raw processing power of NVIDIA's 30 series cards is unmatched, delivering you the best frame rates and resolutions on the market today. In addition to that, you also get ray tracing, which is a technique that simulates light using an algorithm, resulting in the most realistic rendition of light we've ever seen in video games. The most impressive tech is one utilized in The Ascent, and it's called DLSS, which stands for Deep Learning Super Sampling. What this does is it renders your game at a lower resolution while making it look like it's running at a higher resolution, giving your GPU more headroom to spend on higher graphical settings and frame rates. The Ascent isn't too graphically demanding as a benchmark, but when I tested DLSS on Outriders, I picked up an average of around 40 frames a second, and that's a big increase. Pair that with the laptop's 144Hz screen, and you can expect a silky smooth experience even when the action is thickest. In addition to a sleek design, each MSI Sword Series laptop comes equipped with their signature Cooler Booster cooling system, with airflow through both the bottom and sides of the laptop to keep temperatures nice and low. Gaming laptops aren't the giant bricks they used to be. They're smaller, thinner, lighter, and more portable than ever before, but they're just as versatile. You may want to use a laptop as your main driver, plugging it into monitors as you would a desktop PC, or even better, you can plug it into a TV, allowing you to enjoy your games on big screens with surround sound setups. To learn more about NVIDIA's next-gen GPUs or the MSI Sword G15 laptop, click the link in the description below. Thanks NVIDIA and MSI for supporting the video, and thank you for watching it. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down so I know to do better for next time. If you enjoyed yourself, consider subscribing. And if you really enjoyed yourself, maybe consider hitting that notification bell so you never miss a video. You can see my patrons here on the left. They're awesome. They're amazing. If you want to join them, check out my Patreon page. Thank you again. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.